Here are 10 common mistakes DIYers make in their electrical panels or circuit breaker boxes. Now we will be covering a fix for each of these that I can walk you through and keep in mind these are in no particular order. So let's kick it off with our first one and that is the frustrating experience of opening up your panel only to find this. There's nothing here. Sometimes there's no description at all, other times it's an outdated description, and other times you're just wondering, how the heck am I supposed to read that? This is gibberish that doesn't make any sense. Illegible handwriting is kind of a, a bad thing when it comes to electricity. So this can be a real problem. Now this is a good time to remind you that you should always test your receptacles or your switches or whatever it is you're working on to make sure that there is no current running to them, even if you think you've got it turned off here in the electrical panel. Fortunately, this is an easy one to fix. Make sure to take the time to write these in legibly. If you need to, you can buy some labels and I'll put some links in the description below. Now, I have a circuit breaker finder right here that works really well. This is the kind of thing where you, basically you plug this end in to an outlet, for example, and then it even comes with an adapter for working with light bulbs. And then you can use this end to run over each of the circuit breakers and it'll tell you which one is assigned to that particular outlet or receptacle or light switch. It's really handy, but there's a hundred easier ways to do it as well. You can just turn on a loud radio that's plugged in, you can have someone yell, you can do the cell phone walkie-talkie thing, whatever you need to do, but make sure you get these labeled appropriately. Mistake number two is overloading your circuit breaker panel. Now you can see on this particular panel, this thing is pretty chock full. We have our entire house running on this, including the basement, which was unfinished when we moved in. So this really can't handle any more than it's got right here. The more important thing is that you know how many amps you can handle in this panel and that you are only using up to about 80% of that amperage. So for example, this is a 150 amp panel. So I wanna make sure that I'm not using more than 120 amps of the juice that this can provide at any given time. It doesn't mean that I have to keep this to 120 or even 150 amps worth of circuit breakers. When I add all these up, it's gonna be more than that and that's okay. It's more about the usage within your home. Now, the more you stack in here, especially if you're using tandems like this where I'm getting 30 plus 30, you know, that kind of thing can add up pretty quickly. And the more of those you have, the more likely it is that you'll be able to use those and overload your panel. So you wanna be careful to make sure that you're not putting too much in there. And if you need to, create a separate sub panel. I'll have a whole video coming out about that next week. Mistake number three on our list is not protecting the sheathing of the wires on the inside and letting them rub up against the knockouts inside the panel. Now I'm gonna take this cover off. I've got all the screws but one off. I'm gonna support the panel with one hand while I remove this last screw to make sure it doesn't slip or fall into the panel itself. So with that being supported, I can now pull that out and put it aside. You can see up here, we've got a pretty good job up here. We've got our push-in plastic connectors or bushings here. Um, we've got everything here coming in as it should. There are no wires going directly into the actual panel knockouts without being supported or protected by a bushing or a connector here. And that's exactly what we want. When you don't have that, that could start to serrate the edges of these and cause a short or a fault. Now this is a great time as we remove the panel cover here for you to pause for a second and think, am I ready to do this? Is this something that I'm qualified and trained to do? Do I have confidence in what I'm doing or is this a little bit of guesswork? If there's guesswork, if you're unsure, if you don't have that confidence that you know you're doing it right and you've done your research, then maybe call an electrician and get them to help you. There is some serious voltage and amperage running through here that you wanna treat with respect. Mistake number four is having an imbalance between your circuit breaker amperage and your wire gauge. If you look up top here, we'll see that we've got multiple colors of wires coming in. We've got these white sheathed Romex here, and then we've also got some yellows as well. Now the white typically indicates a 14 gauge wire. Remember with gauges, the higher the number, the thinner the wire is. And over here, these yellows represent a 12 gauge wire, so it's a little bit thicker. Now that makes a big difference on what they're connected to. What we don't wanna do is allow a thinner gauge wire to have an amperage of circuit breaker that exceeds its capacity. Generally speaking, 15 amp circuits should use at least a 14 gauge wire, and it could be thicker, that's okay. We don't want it to be thinner. And then these 20 amps will use a 12 gauge wire. Now the issue you might run into is, let's say you have a 20 or a 30 amp circuit breaker in here, and you've got 14 gauge wire. 
that's actually capable of producing a lot more electricity, pushing a lot more voltage essentially, or amperage really, through the wire than a 14 gauge wire is designed to handle. And what could happen is that heats up and that creates, again, a potential for fault or issues, fire, different things like that. So we don't want that overheating to occur. So we wanna make sure that you match up the gauge of wire with the amperage of each circuit. Number five on our list is improper grounding. And there's several ways that I've seen this happen. I just saw a box the other day actually where someone actually snipped the main ground coming in from the source and they just cut it right here. Nothing in the whole panel was grounded at all. I have no idea honestly why they would do that or what they thought they were trying to accomplish here, but that is a huge mistake. Another one that I've seen before is when they take a bunch of these different ground wires here and then they twist them all together and then they run one pigtail down into the ground bus bar. That's also not okay. It can be okay, depending on the area, for you to use a wire nut there and you can match a bunch of them up there, put a wire nut with a pigtail going off. That's actually all right in most areas, but again, check with your local code on that. What's not okay is just to twist them together, assume they're gonna have good enough contact and then run a pigtail off of that. So make sure that everything is properly grounded and you can easily tell, for example, in mine, if I move these wires out of the way over here, you can see that the main ground comes in right here and then it's attached to the bus bar. And then this bus bar is attached to the other ground bus bar by the panel itself. You don't need to have a wire running from here over to here for grounding or making that connection with the ground. It's actually the metal panel that's making that connection there and that's perfectly okay. Number six on our list is doubling up on your wiring within the same hole on the bus bar. I found an example of that here on this neutral. Right down here at the end, I've got two neutrals going into the exact same hole, which is kind of silly because there are plenty of available neutral holes on this bus bar. There's no good reason to do that other than maybe a bit of laziness or a misunderstanding there. When you have two, you're increasing the likelihood of a poor connection. And that's something that again could shake loose over time or just not have a tight connection and that could cause arcing, sparking, other issues like that. I've got an issue with it right there and then on my ground bar it's all over the place. There's bunches of them and those are pretty easy fixes, especially if you have a lot of open holes in your bus bar for neutrals or for grounds. Number seven on our list is using the improper sheathing coloring for your wires. Now there's pretty simple National Electric Code about this here in the United States and it basically says that your neutrals have to be white or gray and that your ground has to be green or bare wire. And so it doesn't really specify much about the black, for example, for your hot or the red for your secondary hot, but that is the well understood color set for anything electrical in these panels. So what I noticed in my panel right here, the electrician who wired this house up before we bought this wired up a neutral as a secondary hot or what appears to be a neutral. Now that would be okay if we made one little change to this. So what we need to do is just take some electrical tape that's red and use that to wrap around and indicate that that is not in fact neutral, but is a secondary hot. And there we go. Now that lets anybody who's working on this in the future know that this is a secondary hot, not a neutral line. You can kind of figure that out if you're looking at it, but let's not make it any more difficult than it needs to be. Number eight on our list is what are called double tapped circuit breakers. Now this is illegal or against code at least in some areas. And then in other circumstances and situations, it's actually totally okay to do. So you have to know when you can use this and when you cannot. Now you can see, for example, if I were to feed two different hots or two different lines into this one circuit breaker, that may or may not be against code. It depends on how this one was designed. You can see on this Eaton circuit breaker, for example, this 20 amp really is designed just for one wire to be fed in. If you look at the specs on the side, it shows a 14 to 10 gauge, an eight gauge, or even a six to four gauge. And it has all the specs for that, that's okay. But it doesn't say anything about applying two different wires to the same circuit breaker. That's because it's not up to manufacturer's specs to land two different wires into this thing. However, if you look at the Square D home line series, for example, these typically tend to allow for that. If we take a look on the side here, you can see there's a very clear illustration of mounting one wire in or two wires. 
So we can follow those guidelines. And again, if you flip over to the side and see the lug here, it's got two plates where you can clearly receive two different wires based on the curvature of those plates. Now, double tapping is kind of a frowned upon practice, mostly because it means you've got two home runs or two lines running off the same circuit breaker. It makes it a little bit trickier sometimes to troubleshoot, especially if those two areas of the home or the business are not right next to each other, that can be problematic to troubleshoot as well. Number nine on our list is missing filler plates. Your circuit breaker panel cover has these different knockouts for different circuit breakers. And you wanna make sure to only knock out those that are filled with a circuit breaker. What can happen is sometimes some changes are made in the home, maybe some circuits are rewired to a sub panel, and then you have these open slots here. Or perhaps you got a little aggressive and you knocked out too many of those knockouts and you have more open holes than you have circuit breakers to fill. In that case, that's actually totally against code again because someone could just reach their fingers in there and put their fingers where they're not supposed to. It can be dangerous and it's an easy fix. You can buy filler blanks right from the store. You can sell these at Home Depot and Lowe's. You can buy them on Amazon. These are pretty easy, so get these filler plates put one of those in there, make sure you don't have any open holes in your circuit breaker panel. Now we're almost on our last one, but I do wanna remind you that I will have a video coming out about how to install a new sub panel. I'm putting one in my garage, for example, and I'll walk you through step-by-step -step all of that. You can check that out using the link at the end of the video or in the description below. And as always, every product that I show in this video, you can check out that little shopping bag in the lower left corner to see those from Home Depot or Lowe's or other stores like that. Or you can check out the links in the description below. Now on to number 10, which is not torquing your screws down to the right tension. All of the lugs or screws inside this panel have a specific tension that they need to be torqued down to. And if you look, for example, on our different circuit breakers, just like we saw earlier, it shows how much pressure these need to have. Um, in fact, we've got a breakdown right here, for example, that this says 36 inch pounds or four Newton meters. So that same thing applies to the lugs on here, but then there are different measurements or ratings for our bigger lugs over here, and those are typically located on the inside of the panel. So you wanna make sure to do that up to code and make sure you're following those specifications. Most people don't have something like this. This is a torque screwdriver, and it allows you, there's different ways to adjust these based on the brand, and then when it maxes out, it's no longer gonna apply that tension. So I keep turning and turning, and then it'll get to that, in this case, it's set to 50 inch pounds of torque, and then when it's done, it's not gonna turn anymore. So I know I've got it just at the right spot. And in a lot of companies nowadays, they're actually going around, and they're actually, once a year, just testing all of the screws and lugs to make sure that they're tightened the appropriate amount. And this is a smart thing to do in your house as well. Now I will say, I think most of the time, DIYers, especially like myself, we're not necessarily going around and saying, okay, I've got to get it right to 36 inch pounds. But believe it or not, these only cost about 40 bucks. I know it's not super cheap, but to make sure that you're getting it just right, I think it's a good little investment. And again, I'll put links to that in the description below so that you can make sure that you're getting all of these set to just the right torque. Now, just one last little bonus issue that I wanna throw out there. Here's an example of a beautifully wired and beautifully patterned panel. I love looking at something like this. To me, it's a form of art. It's done well, it's easy to recognize, it's easy to trace the lines, and it's easy to add on more. Here's an example of what we want to avoid. A tangled rat's nest like this can be really difficult to find out what's what, and it makes it easy to accidentally touch wires when you don't mean to, or to remove the wrong one because it's hard to trace. So the more organization you have, the more of a pattern that you apply to your layout inside your panel, the better off you'll be in the future as well as anyone working after you. While we're on the topic of wiring, you might enjoy this video right here where it shows six mistakes DIYers make when wiring outlets. And some of these are pretty surprising. I was gonna say shocking, I restrained myself. Yeah, I can do that. I'm Nils with Learn to DIY. Thanks for watching.